All right, hello everyone. Can you all hear me? Does everyone have their sound working? Do your check now. All right, well, welcome to episode five of our Experts Next Door series, a, a virtual speaker series hosted by the Saratoga County History Center. I am Dr. Michael Landis, trustee of the center and member of the Education and Programs Committee. I also teach history at Union College. Just so you know, we will keep you all on mute until the presentation has ended. Please either hold your questions or comments until after the talk or post them in the comments section and we can read them uh, when the time comes. Tonight, we welcome a very special guest, our most famous speaker yet, Dr. Tyler Anbinder, Professor Emeritus at the prestigious George Washington University. Dr. Anbinder is arguably the nation's top expert on New York immigration history, as well as an acclaimed scholar of 19th century American politics. He is the author of three monumental books, most recently, City of Dreams, the 400 year epic history of immigrant New York, which won the New York City Book Award. Before that was Five Points, the 19th century New York neighborhood that invented tap dance, stole elections, and became the world's most notorious slum which also won the New York City Book Award. It is worth noting that Dr. Ann Binder's groundbreaking research on New York City politics and culture landed him a consulting gig on Martin Scorsese's blockbuster movie, Gangs of New York in 2002. You can even see Dr. Ann Binder on the DVD special features. My favorite book of Dr. Ann Binder's and the book that largely inspired my own work on antebellum politics was his first, Nativism and Slavery, the Northern Know-Nothings and the Politics of the 1850s, an essential read for anyone trying to figure out the briar patch of politics before the Civil War. Along the way, Dr. Ambiner has won a king's ransom of awards and fellowships, including the Distinguished Teaching Award from the George Washington University and a whopping $290,000 award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we simply don't have the time to list his numerous articles, essays, and op-eds in major international media outlets. But his current book project is the, quote, The Great Famine and the Making of Irish New York. Before I turn this over to Dr. Ambinder, though, please allow me to remind you that his books, including City of Dreams, are available through Northshire Bookstore, both in the store and online. As many of you know, Northshire is a locally owned and operated business that works tirelessly to serve its community and promote great literature and scholarship. We hope you will give them your business. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Ambinder. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for that very kind introduction. You can hear me okay, Michael? Okay, great. Um, can we turn, can we uh, change things over to slide mode there? And I still have some people signing in. So it's, uh, this may be the best bet to, to, for everyone to see yet still everyone, get everyone in, so. All right, well in that case, go to the next slide then. Okay. Although actually, Anne, let's go to the one after that. That's a copy of my, my there we go. This will hold us for a while while you let people in. So, um, so I wrote City of Dreams, which came out in, in 2016. It's hard to believe it's four years ago already since, since it came out, since it took up my life for more than a decade. Um, I wrote City of Dreams for a number of reasons. There were a lot of myths about um, immigrant history that I felt like needed to be um, where the record needed to be set straight. And among those myths was the idea that today's immigrants are fundamentally different than immigrants from the past in American history. And so that's, you know, there are many themes, obviously a, a book that covers 400 years of immigration history is going to have a lot of themes. City of Dreams has, has many themes. But the overriding theme is this idea that today's immigrants aren't that different than immigrants from the past. And there are 10 main ways I'd like to talk about tonight in which I find that that's the case. And you can see them listed here. So first, 
that today's immigrants are poorer, more impoverished than immigrants from the past. Second, that many of today's immigrants don't wait in line for their turn to get into the United States like our grandparents or great grandparents did. Third, that many immigrants, uh, that many immigrants from uh, today are illegal, whereas that was an unheard of thing in the past. Fourth, that immigrants commit more crime today than immigrants did in the past. Fifth, that immigrants don't learn English the way they used to. Sixth, that immigrants take government handouts today, something that they didn't do in the past. Seventh, that immigrants pose a threat to America's national security. Seventh, the idea that immigrants don't become citizens like they used to. Eight or nine, that immigrants don't assimilate. And finally, that today's immigrants can never become quote unquote true Americans. So I'd like to go through these one at a time in my 40 minutes, less than 40 minutes that I have now, and just make sure that, um, I'm gonna set my little timer here so I can make sure I don't go over, because I can talk for this about this forever, as you can imagine, and talk about each of these things. And, and then at the end, we'll open it up for questions and comments. So Anne, could we get the next slide, please? Great. So one thing that's said is that today's immigrants are much poorer than immigrants from the past. Um, this is definitely not true. And there's a number of reasons why. Um, for one thing, today's immigrants mostly um, have to prove that they have a significant sum of money to get into the United States. Both if you have a, and that's, that's true both for, um, that's true both for regular immigrants and even for uh, undocumented immigrants. Most undocumented immigrants get a visa to come to the United States and then overstay their visas, right? So we, we tend to imagine that the, that, the, that the typical undocumented immigrant is someone who snuck across the border, but those are very much a minority of, of uh, illegal immigrants. The majority are people who got visas to come to the United States and then overstayed their visas. And to either get that tourist visa or to get that um, immigration visa, you've got to prove that you have a significant sum of money in the bank. And so today's immigrants uh, have quite a bit of financial wherewithal. On the other hand, here's an image of uh, Italian immigrants from 130 years ago uh, in Little Italy in New York, uh, 13 Italians sleeping in a 12 by 12 foot room. That gives you a sense of how impoverished they were. And believe it or not, Italian immigrants weren't even the poorest immigrants ever to arrive in the United States, despite what you see in, in the image. That's a picture taken by Jacob Rees, by the way, who himself was an immigrant, a, a famous journalist. Um, the Irish famine immigrants who I'm writing about now who came to the United States as a result of uh, the Great Famine, they're probably the poorest ever to arrive in the United States um, and much poorer than the immigrants who typically arrive in the United States today. Uh, can we get the next image, please? So we might think of today's immigrants, well, what about the immigrants who sneak across the border? And here's an image, right? Today, we think of illegal immigrants as being overwhelmingly uh, Latino, uh, but we forget that actually there's, there's virtually as large a number, say, coming from Asia. Um, and in fact, the famous illegal immigrants of the 1990s uh, came from China. This was a, a ship, the Golden Venture, that was full of uh, uh, illegal immigrants. And when their plan to uh, ferry their, their, illegal their illegal immigrants to shore uh, fell apart, the captain of the ship ran the ship aground um, uh, in Long Island and told the Chinese to jump ashore. And that's an image of one of them from, from the uh, picture there. So you might imagine that these are poor people, but in fact, they had to have tens of thousands of dollars to pay to get on that tramp ship to get to the United States. Those are middle-class Chinese who are coming to America. So despite what we might think, uh, both legal and even the majority of illegal immigrants coming to the United States today have much more money than the typical immigrant from the past who could come to the United States uh, with, with virtually nothing. Can we get the next slide, please? So 
So the next issue is do immigrants wait online like they used to? Here's an image of Ellis Island and, and immigrants uh, quote unquote waiting online to get into the United States. But there are a couple of fallacies involved here. So, so clearly there is a line to get through Ellis Island, but there was no line to get to the United States as many people could come to the United States in whatever order they wanted to. And so it's really important to understand that there really is no line at all other than the line to get to the podium at Ellis Island. And in fact, before Ellis Island opened in 1892, there was no line at all. You would, your ship would dock at, at any pier it wanted to on the Hudson River, on the East River in Boston, and an immigrant just got off the ship and started their life in America with no processing, no paperwork at all. Today, on the other hand, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, Anne, is there any way you can make that bigger? Like make it full screen or something so people can see it a little better. There we go, thank you. Uh, so today, this gives you a sense of the line to become uh, an immigrant today. And as you can see, it's very complicated. Um, today, to become an immigrant in the United States, you have to do one of two things. You either have to have a short, a very in-demand skill, like you might be a computer programmer, you might be a nurse or a doctor. Those things get you to the front of the line. The other thing that gets you to the front of the line is having a relative, a close relative already in the United States. But if you don't have a close relative already in the United States, or you're not a doctor or one of those things, or a professor for that matter, then there's actually no line to get into, right? You can't qualify to become an immigrant in the United States if you don't meet one of those two things. So this is one of the things people don't understand is there, there literally is no line for most people in the world to get into, to, to immigrate to the United States, none at all. They simply don't qualify them. And that's the main reason for uh, undocumented immigration today is, is people who can't, who aren't allowed to immigrate because they don't have a close relative here, don't have one of those skills. And that's a whole new thing that, that didn't exist for most of America's history. Can we go to the next one, please, Anne? So then there's this idea that illegal immigrants are a recent phenomenon, that we didn't have those in the past. But as this headline from the 1920s shows, immigrant smuggling has, has a long history in the United States that goes back almost 150 years. Now, before the 1880s, there was no such thing as immigrant smuggling because there was no such thing as an illegal immigrant. Anybody could immigrate to the United States. But starting in the 1880s with the Chinese Exclusion Act, for the first time, you have a group of people who can't legally come to the United States. And it's only when immigration restriction starts that immigrants start um, being smuggled into the United States. And as you can imagine, first that's Chinese immigrants because they're the only ones who are banned. Then starting in the first decade of the 20th century, the Japanese are banned and you start getting uh, the smuggling of them as well. Uh, and, and then as we get to more modern history, uh, for most of American history, there was no restriction on immigration from the Western Hemisphere. So people from Central South America uh, could come to the United States in unlimited numbers. It's only uh, in the last 50, 60 years that limits were put on people from the Americas. And as a result, you now get, um, you now get immigrant smuggling from those places as well. Um, but in the 1920s, the two big groups who were smuggled into the United States who came in illegally were Italians and Eastern European Jews. And you had tens of thousands of both those groups coming illegally to the United States per year. Italians would come mainly through the Caribbean. Cuba was the fa favorite jumping off point. Eastern European Jews would come primarily through Canada. Um, and both groups came to the United States uh, in the as I said, tens of thousands per year. Uh, and so the idea that, that illegal immigration is a new thing is again uh, a myth. 
Can we get the next one, please, Anne? Immigrants and crime. So you may recall during the 2016 presidential campaign, uh, then candidate Trump made a uh, made the link explicit, saying that uh, Mexico doesn't send the good people, it sends the criminals to the United States. And this has long been a theme of anti-immigrant sentiment in American history, that immigrants uh, are prime that immigrants commit more crime than other people, and that criminals come disproportionately to the United States amongst immigrants. And here you can see a couple of famous immigrant criminals from American history. Uh, Meyer Lansky on the left, who uh, got involved among other things with uh, gambling in Las Vegas. Uh, and then uh, Bugsy Siegel on the right, who was a German immigrant who became famous as a bootlegger during prohibition in the 1920s. So the press has, for almost as long as there's been an American press, has made the insinuation that immigrants are more likely to commit crimes than other people. In fact, we have statistics on this subject going back all the way to the beginning of American history. And the statistics are very, very consistent. Immigrants always commit less crime per capita than other people in the United States. Native born Americans are much more likely to commit crimes, be arrested for crimes and get convicted for crimes. And in large part, that's because immigrants know that if they get caught committing a crime, they are liable to, uh, to being deported. And immigrants more than anything else wanna be allowed to stay in the United States. So immigrants are much less likely to commit crimes than other Americans. Uh, yet at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the press was full of accounts uh, and, and the New York police, uh, for example, even, even uh, made these statements that Eastern European Jews were uh, disproportionate among New York's criminals until the police commissioner's own, uh, own statistical staff pointed out to him that the opposite was the case. And you've seen this said, of course, famously about Italian immigrants and, and the emphasis on, on the mafia. Uh, but even despite its existence, uh, Italian immigrants commit less crime than native born immigrants do on a per capita basis. And that's just been very consistent throughout American history. Can we get the next slide, please, Anne? So another question that you constantly, or another statement you constantly hear is that today's immigrants don't learn English like immigrants from the past. And often you'll hear this said, well, my grandfather, or I guess for some of you in the audience, my great grandfather, if you knew that person, they learned English. Why don't today's immigrants learn English? Well, these, these examples of, of Yiddish language newspapers from New York, which are just one small piece of evidence to show that immigrants uh, throughout American history have not learned English very well. And, and some people think, well, you know, today's immigrants are less likely to learn English because they can watch you know, TV in their native language or listen to podcasts in their native language or even watch uh, television shows from their homelands on the internet, and therefore they're not learning English like they used to. But in fact, immigrants have always had means to access their culture in their native tongue. And that would have been through, uh, through foreign language newspapers, which existed by the hundreds and hundreds throughout the United States. I mean, the, New York alone had hundreds of foreign language newspapers. So the United States as a whole has had thousands of them over the years. Um, but foreign language um, uh, was also, you know, in, in uh, theater, uh, in literature. Uh, and so it was not hard at all for most immigrants to live their lives in America without learning English at all. In fact, in many parts of the Midwest, uh, you had public schools conducted in languages other than English. This was especially the case in, in kind of the belt stretching from uh, Iowa to the Dakotas where German immigrants were especially likely to demand that the public schools be run in German so that their children would learn good German. Um, but up in the Dakotas, sometimes this might uh, mean uh, having school in Norwegian or Swedish instead. But it was Germans primarily who pushed this and, and there were lots of German language public schools in the United States up until World War I when Americans suddenly uh, in the rest of the country became aware of this and saw this as unpatriotic. And at that point, those schools were stamped out. 
Um, can we get the next one, please, Anne? So another thing you'll hear uh, mentioned constantly is that immigrants come for handouts, that the United States has such a generous public welfare system, and that's why immigrants come to America uh, for those things that they don't want to work, that they just want government handouts. So th th there are a couple of things wrong with that perception. First, the United States compared to other immigrant destinations doesn't actually have very generous uh, welfare system. You've got a much more generous welfare system in Western Europe, for example, uh, than you do in the United States, right? You immigrate to Western Europe, you're gonna get free healthcare for life. You don't get that in the United States. So, uh, so that's one thing to, to, to keep in mind. The other myth is that um, government handouts weren't available back uh, when previous generations of immigrants came to America. Uh, but that's simply not true. This is an image uh, of a tunnel being built under the East River in New York during the, the New Deal. And you have, uh, uh, you know, this image is to try to show everyone was eligible for this. You've got an African American there on the right and a uh, Latino, probably from Puerto Rico on the left, to show that that not only were whites, but Blacks and, and uh, Hispanics uh, were allowed uh, to get these public works jobs. And if public works jobs weren't available, uh, everyone, all citizens were eligible for uh, the New Deal welfare programs as well. And even before the New Deal, uh, which is really when the federal government starts having uh, welfare programs on a grand, on a large scale. But even before the New Deal, states had their own welfare programs that date back to the Progressive Era around 1900. And so immigrants were eligible for those pro pro programs back then and took advantage of them when they needed them. But of course, most people aren't going to take advantage of them if they can help it because they don't pay as well as, as an actual job. And so immigrants have uh, throughout American history taken advantage of such programs when they needed them. And this even predates the progressive era. If you go back to the period I'm writing about now with the, the great famine and the famine immigration of the 1840s and 1850s, if you're an Irish immigrant in the 1850s in New York and you, you uh, say you got sick and you couldn't work, um, the local democratic a party operative would make sure that you, that uh, food arrived on your doorstep or coal to burn in your in your stove if it was winter time, um, and that would be paid for by the local uh, political machine that got the money to pay for it by stealing the money from the government. You know that's what Boss Tweed became famous for in New York, and you had similar machines, some run by Democrats, some run by Republicans. Um, in all the major cities of the United States in the Civil War period. So there have always been government uh, welfare programs, either official or unofficial for immigrants when they've needed them. Can we go to the next one, please? So do immigrants pose a threat to national security that's new? Well, certainly there are immigrants who pose a threat to national security. Um, but there have always been immigrants who posed a threat to national security. On the screen here again, because I wrote about New York, I have New Yorkers, but we could go to other cities and, and use other examples. So Johann Most here on the left, he was a famous German immigrant, um, probably the most famous socialist in the United States in the 1870s and 80s. In particular, he was a radical socialist. So you had among socialists, you had the democratic socialists, let's elect socialists to office and have them implement our agenda. And then you had uh, Most who was a uh, self-declared anarcho-socialist, meaning he wanted to use uh, violence if necessary to bring, about, uh, to bring about socialism and fair pay uh, to workers everywhere. Um, most inspired with German and, uh, but he inspired Jewish immigrants coming later from Eastern Europe. Most famously, he inspired these two in the, in the center and on the right, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, who were immigrants from Russia. And 
they became followers of most and decided, whereas most never actually carried out, uh, most would propose violence, but never actually carried it out. Goldman and Berkman took his took most teachings to their logical extreme and carried out such violence. So if you go to the next slide, and you'll see that um, you'll see that uh, Goldman and Berkman's uh, followers in New York decided to build a bomb that they would try to use to assassinate John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil. Uh, they were constructing the bomb in a tenement on the uh, Upper East Side of New York, but the bomb went off before they could deliver it to Rockefeller and it blew the top of the tenement off instead. And if you go to the next slide, please, Anne. Uh, Eastern European Jews weren't the only ones uh, using violence. The bombing in the United States that caused the most uh, deaths in all of American history up to that point uh, outside of wartime was uh, in 1920 when a bomb was detonated on Wall Street across the street from the New York Stock Exchange that killed upwards of 50 people. It was set by Italian immigrant anarchists uh, who had traveled down from Massachusetts to, uh, to uh, plot the terrorist attack. And so immigrants throughout American history have been involved in terror activities, but of course, you know, those are very, very much the exception rather than the rule. And for pretty much all of American history, Americans have followed the dictate that, you know, you should prosecute those who commit crimes rather than banning any group because a few members of that group commit crimes. Can we go to the next one, please? So the next question is, do today's immigrants become citizens like immigrants from the past? So the answer is actually mostly no, but it's no in the opposite way from what most people expect. Immigrants today are much more likely to become citizens than immigrants from the past. And when they do become citizens, they uh, becoming a citizen requires a lot more education than it did uh, in, in American institutions than it did back then. So here's an image from the 1870s. And what this image is showing, it's a, it shows a courtroom in New York City. And this is a few weeks before a presidential election. And what the political parties would do back then is they would offer to pay for your citizenship so that you would be grateful to the political parties and hopefully vote for their candidates at the upcoming election. So if you were an immigrant and wanted to become a citizen, you would, and say you were eligible in 1871, you would probably wait till the following year, 1872, when you knew that the political parties would pay for your um, citizenship costs. Now the citizenship costs then were, uh, were tiny. It was a couple of dollars. But nonetheless, if you're a frugal immigrant, you, you're gonna wait until some politician will pay for you. Now let's say though, you don't have any proof that you've actually been in the United States five years. No problem. The political party will provide you with a witness who will swear that you have lived in the United States five years, even if you have no written proof that that's the case. And so there would be such a demand for these swearing it, for these uh, immigration proceedings that you would have scenes like this in courtrooms where hundreds and hundreds of people would be made citizens in a day going through the whole process of swearing to have been in the United States five years and two witnesses coming with them to swear to their eligibility. And so this made a mockery of the whole process, the whole idea that you were supposed to actually have verifiable proof that you'd been in the United States with two real witnesses who knew you. Now, you compare that um, to today, if we go to the next image. So today, to become a citizen, it costs thousands of dollars instead of a few dollars. And politicians don't pay for you to become a citizen anymore. So it's much harder to become a citizen today than it was in the past. Back then, that, that image I showed you just a second ago of those people in that 1870s courtroom, probably lots of those people in that room didn't even speak a word of English, didn't matter. You could do the entire process in German, which is what most of those non-English speakers in that room were. Um, 
You could do the entire process in German, in any language you wanted, and become a citizen. There was no requirement to know any English. There was no citizenship. There was no test where you had to show any knowledge of American institutions. The only thing you had to do to become a citizen was find two witnesses to swear you had been in the United States for five years and hadn't committed a crime. Today, on the other hand, first, you have to prove you know English by passing a test in English. Second, you have to learn all sorts of things about American civics, what the Constitution says, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's a test that probably 75%, maybe 90% of American, of native-born Americans couldn't pass. But, immig but immigrants who want to become citizens, they learn those things and they pass the test. So probably a newly minted immigrant is much more likely to be able to tell you how the electoral college works, for example, than a native born American because they're required to learn that in order to become citizens. Can we get the next one, please? So number nine on our list was this question of whether immigrants assimilate today like they used to. And lots of, of Amer native born Americans today believe that immigrants just don't assimilate like immigrants from the past. So there are a couple of things going on with that belief. First, if you had an immigrant in your own family, um, you might tend to, to remember that immigrant. So let's say that grandparent, and you might remember them, um, you know, having learned a little English, having learned a little bit about America, maybe following American sports, uh, and therefore they seemed assimilated to you. But that's mostly because they were your own family member. To most native born Americans, especially from another ethnic group, that grandparent or great grandparent didn't seem assimilated at all. So, and what I found in doing the research for, for, my, for my book is, is it's not so much that immigrants yesteryear, of yesteryear assimilated uh, more than we think. What I actually found is that immigrants throughout American history, immigrants who come as adults, just don't actually assimilate very much that adults who arrive in the United States will spend you know, 90% of the time, will spend the rest of their adult lives in America eating the same foods they ate in their, the place where they were born, playing the same games they played in their homeland, singing the same songs, eating the same foods, reading that native language. Adults, adults who immigrate tend not to assimilate that much. That was the case back then, that's the case now. So it's not that today's immigrants assimilate less, it's just that we're not really cognizant of the fact that adult immigrants have never really assimilated that much at all. Now, if you immigrate as a child, that's a different matter. Children wanna fit in. And so when they go to school, they wanna fit in with their native born schoolmates. And so children who assimilate, children who immigrate assimilate a lot and quickly, but adults tend not to assimilate very much. And adults, adult immigrants, for the most part, have always lived in enclaves with other immigrants. And so it's been easy not to assimilate that much. And that was the case in the past. You know, New York had its Little Italy, the Lower East Side, where everyone spoke Yiddish and so forth. And here you've got on the right, this is uh, one of the Chinatowns in Queens, uh, New York. And uh, that again, there you could you can spend years in that Chinatown and never have to speak a word of English. So, it's, so the assimilation uh, is really the same today as it's been in the past. And then next slide, please. So then we get to our final point, number 10, that today's immigrants can never be true Americans. Yet again, what I found in, in writing City of Dreams was that this has been said of every generation of immigrants who has ever come to the United States. So when Scots first started coming in large numbers to the United States in the mid 1700s, the English, uh, uh, in, the English in America said, oh, those Scots, they can never be real Americans like us. And then when you get into the early 19th century, when the Irish start coming to the United States, the native born Americans of Scottish and English heritage say, oh, those Irish, they can never be true Americans. And in part, they say that because the Irish are, are mostly Catholics. And they say the United States is a Protestant nation. That's what makes America great is its Protestantism. So when all these Catholic 
uh, Irish start coming, and then these Catholic Germans start coming, and even Protestant Germans who don't speak English, uh, the same thing is said. Well, those, those Germans, those Irish, they can never be true Americans because really the United States is a, you know, an Anglo-Saxon uh, nation. Eventually the Germans and the Irish are seen as being true Americans. By that point, all those groups are now saying, well, those new immigrants, the Italians, the Jews, they can't be true Americans. Uh, but they're eventually accepted. And then the next group is said to not be able to be true Americans. That's the image actually we have uh, right here. This is a, a parade in the early 20th century. Uh, and here are, um, here are immigrants from East Asia trying to show very hard that they can be true Americans by dressing as Uncle Sam and the Statue of Liberty. But as you can imagine, they were greeted very skeptically. And then the same thing has been said, you know, of every uh, immigrant generation, right? Eventually Americans started to say, well, you know, you have to be from the Judeo-Christian ethic to be a true American. And that was said for it to be a reason why uh, Muslims can't be true Americans. But what, what I expect is that, you know, just as there was a time when people said Catholics can't be true Americans and then they were accepted and then people said Jews can't be true Americans and they were mostly accepted and people said uh, people from Central and South America can't be true Americans and they've been accepted and same for people from East Asia or South Asia that eventually the same will be said for Muslim immigrants too. So can we get the next image please? So just to wrap up and look at some images that, that make these points, here's a New York tenement in 1890, full of Italian immigrants. If we go to the next slide, here's a 12 by 12 room in the exact same neighborhood, a hundred years later, full of Chinese immigrants. So the more things change, the more they, they stay the same. Can we go to the next one, please? Here are Eastern European Jews working, uh, doing garment work on the Lower East Side in the 1890s in a tenement. And if we go to the next slide, please, here are Chinese immigrants doing garment work on the Lower East Side in a tenement that's been converted into a sweatshop in the 20th century. And the next one, please. So here's a picture of members of my family to give you a sense of how my family fits into the story. On the bottom left there, the one boy in the picture, that's my grandfather, Tulia, who I never met because he died a couple of years before I was born. Uh, but there are his sisters, his four sisters, um, and then his mother. Um, and they all came from Holoskov, which was a shtetl in the Ukraine. Um, this was a picture they sent to New York in the 19 teens because who's missing in the picture is the father, my great grandfather. He came to New York in 1911, got a job working in a sweatshop as a presser, uh, ironing the clothes that the sweatshop workers had sewn. Um, but it took him a long time to save up enough money to bring six family members to America. So they would send a picture like this every once in a while. We have three of these, one and in each one, my uh, grandfather and, his, and my great aunts are getting older and older. And this was the kind of picture you would send to the first person who came to America to say, don't forget about us, save up that money, don't be squandering it. Um, but then World War I intervened. So it was actually more than a decade before the family was reunited after World War I. Uh, but they all made it to America and my, Great grandfather, who started out, who worked for 10 years as a presser, eventually started his own garment business making baby clothes and had the family members work sewing the clothes uh, that the family then sold to wholesalers. So, next slide, please. So, that's the story. And uh, as I mentioned, I go through the history of immigrant New York in, in City of Dreams. So probably your ethnic group is represented there. Uh, as I said, we start with the Dutch, we go to the English, the Scots, the Irish, the Germans, um, Eastern European Jews, Italians. Uh, then we move on to the modern period, uh, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Chinese, West Indians, and Muslim immigrants round out the survey.
Um, but anyway, that's that's the story, and then uh, I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Ambinder. Um, I think for the sake of organizational purposes, if if you guys can, if the audience can turn on their their chat feature, uh, perhaps that's the best way instead of people all trying to talk at once, especially since screens are not, you can't see everyone's screen. So if you have a question, please, uh, in the in your chat section where you can set uh, to who you're speaking to, put it to all, to public, and uh, type your question there uh, to everyone. Uh, just to get things started, Dr. Ambinder, I have a question about um, your last point about um, becoming accepted as American, um, true American. I'm curious, uh, did you or have you found patterns uh, or similar tactics over the generations and different groups to get to be true American? Um, or to put it differently, how did these groups get to be accepted as true Americans? Yeah, that's a great question. It's So one thing that immigrant groups will try to do is to publicize, kind of publicize their contributions to the United States, that's a very common thing that happens. So, and this will start out in the immigrant press, which of course is not really getting read by the rest of Americans, so it doesn't do much good. But the immigrant press will be full of stories like, you know, look what we do. Why isn't it, why isn't it that Americans appreciate this? And then the editors of those journals hope that the mainstream press is reading them and might, might recount some of those stories. Another thing immigrants do is they, you know, like Jacob Reese, they try to get jobs with the mainstream press and then use that to try to, uh, to try to publicize the things that they do. Um, immigrants will, of, of course, another thing they will do is, is uh, often celebrate holidays that try to draw attention to their contributions. Right, that's how Columbus Day, for example, gets started as a means for uh, Italian Americans to try to show that that you know what they've contributed to American history. Well, it looks like we have some questions in the chat, Michael. So why don't you uh, choose some from there? Are, are, are you able to see them yourself? Can you? you oh, wanna... that's true. I can do that. All right, let me change my glasses here for my reading glasses. I, I, I don't want to be perceived as handling the presenter. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind that, but that's okay. All right. Um, how did the term melting pot become what New York City is known for if in fact there was so much animosity for any new group? That's from Piper. So that's also a great question. And of course the answer is, oh, hi, hi Piper, I see you there. Um, the answer is, of course, that it was an immigrant who came up with that term. And so the term melting pot uh, uh, was coined by uh, an Eastern European Jewish immigrant who was a playwright, Israel Zangwell, as a, as a means to try to show that immigrants uh, become part of America by melting, you know, melting in the crucible of America and thereby becoming part uh, of the new alloy of America, of uh, what it means to become a, an American, and that that what it means to become an American is constantly changing. That it's that it, it's an alloy. It's it's made of steel, so it's very strong. Uh, but the ingredients to that alloy are constantly changing. So let's go to the next question here. I got to get my reading glasses back on. I I can read you the questions if if you prefer. I don't mean for you to keep changing your glasses. Yeah, why not, Michael? If you read them in the order they come, then you can't be accused of uh, favoritism. Yeah. Okay. Oh, darn it. I was going to skip Isabel, but now uh, out of integrity, I have to read her question. Just kidding, Isabel. Um, Isabel uh, says, some of these stories are new to me. What was the motivation for the Italian Wall Street bombing? Well, so we aren't 100% sure because the perpetrators were never caught. So we can't say with certainty what their motivation was. The impression we have uh, from sources within the Italian anarchist community who did speak about this was that 
one, so one of the motivations was clearly um, if you're an anarchist socialist, so if you're a socialist, uh, and in those days, um, socialists were a little different than say Bernie Sanders socialists. Um, socialists wanted um, things like America's steel uh, factories to be taken over by the government and the government to set the wages of the people who work there and the profits to go to be divided equally among all Americans. They wanted uh, uh, things of that sort, the railroads to become public property uh, so that railroads couldn't gouge <coughs> farmers, for example. And so if you believe in that and you're not succeeding in getting that, then the idea of disrupting the New York Stock Exchange where the capitalists who um, run those companies get the capital to finance their businesses. Uh, if, if Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange is where they raise their capital, then disrupting the New York Stock Exchange seemed to them like a, a good way to show uh, that, the, that they were determined to end, end capitalism and, and bring about socialism. The other thing that's that's probably going on as well is there were a lot of arrests of socialists right at the end of World War One, what's known as the Red Scare of 1919, 1920, and socialists were being locked up left and right um, just for espousing the view that um, that uh, the government should run the country's major businesses, even if you didn't necessarily promote violence to do so, just socialists were locked up by the hundreds. And so the Wall Street bombing was a way for socialists to show their animosity to what they saw as their persecution. So it's during this time, for example, that Emma Goldman is deported from the United States. Um, uh, and then, so, and so the arrests in, and the most famous arrests uh, of Italian socialists were like Sacco and Vanzetti were charged with, with murder and eventually executed. So, so the arrests uh, and, and kind of the, the, the main socialist cause in general seem to be behind it, but we don't know for sure. All right, uh, Christine says, or she asks, uh, what is uh, your upcoming book about and when will it be published? So the book I'm working on now, the working title is The Great Famine and the Making of Irish New York. And what I'm doing with that is looking at New York's uh, famine immigrants, the immigrants who come to New York as a result of the Great Famine that starts in 1846 and lasts until 1851. Um, it, it's a really unprecedented influx of refugees into the United States. Um, by 1855, a quarter of adult New Yorkers are immigrants who came as a result of that a famine, so that's just a huge, fast influx of people. And so what I'm looking at in the book is, is the thing that the people I'm looking at have in common is they all opened accounts at the Immigrant Savings Bank, which was this bank that was started by Irish immigrants to try to encourage the famine Irish immigrants to save. And you had to give a lot of information about yourself when you open an account there. So we know a lot about that group and it's about I have 15,000 uh, famine immigrants uh, who I put into a database who opened accounts at that bank. That, by the way, is the $290,000 grant that Michael mentioned at the, at the outset. I, the NEH didn't give me that money. They gave it to George Washington University. And I used the money to hire this army of research assistants, undergraduates, who then transcribed all the handwritten bank records into a database and then did research on places like ancestry.com to find information about these famine immigrants. And I'm kind of weaving their stories together into a narrative that tells the story of the famine generation in New York and beyond, because lots of them start in New York and then leave. And so I'm following them all over the country. Interestingly, I haven't found anyone yet who goes to Saratoga County. I, I'm curious about that. We have some go to Albany. We have some go to Troy. Troy is not, Troy is not in uh, Saratoga County, right? No. Um, but no, not to Saratoga County so far. Uh, but don't worry, we one. had plenty of slave owners here, so it was okay. Is that right? Yes, Saratoga Springs was the summer resort for uh, big time 
slave owners oh, yes, where, the, where the slaveholders would go in the summer yes yes michael um, why don't we get a... to the next question <laughs> oh you don't want to talk about my stuff i got it um john asks uh, I am referring to migrants from El Salvador, Honduras, et cetera. Where do you draw the line between illegal immigrants and refugees? Well, so first of all, I don't draw that line at all. Um, right there. So, so in the period I cover in my book, there was a very set and established process by which you could uh, acquire refugee status, and it was a non, uh, right, there wasn't any debate about it, um, uh, asking for refugee status in the United States was fairly simple, then you, you would ask for it, your case would get adjudicated, and then the government would decide whether you deserve to be considered a refugee or, or not. Um, so when I talk about undocumented immigrants, I'm Generally, I would not be talking about someone who had asked for refugee status and, there, and that was pending. If someone asked for refugee status and was denied and stayed in the United States anyway, then, then I'd consider that to be uh, an undocumented uh, immigrant. Want to go to the next one, Michael? All right. Stephen uh, asks, what, at what period did the rules change that you had to pass tests, et cetera? So it depends on which kind of test you're talking about, whether you're talking about citizenship test or immigration test. So I'll, I'll answer both quickly. So Ellis Island is created in 1892, specifically because Congress uh, in 1890 and 91 passes laws that require immigrants to to pass certain tests before they're allowed to enter the United States. And those tests are, uh, are medical tests and tests, you know, you had, to, you had to, you were asked, you know, have you ever been an anarchist? Have you ever been, later they added on, a communist? Have you ever been a prostitute? Have you ever prostituted others? Um, you had to answer all those questions. And if you answered them the wrong way, you would be barred from the United States. Um, so that starts in 1892, and then they add more rules, more things, you know, they raise the bar as things go along. Eventually in the 20th century, they say you have to have a certain amount of money in addition to answering those questions properly to get into the United States. If you're talking about citizenship, um, for citizenship, um, that is a post-1965 innovation to the citizenship laws. So the immigration laws change dramatically in 1965. Um, although to be exact, the immigration laws, as I discussed them in the, in, in the talk, stayed the same until the 1920s. In the 1920s, Congress passed new laws that barred most people from um, Southern and Eastern Europe and all of Asia from, from immigrating to the United States. The idea that what Congress, what the congressman who, who proposed the law said was, we want to keep the ethnic and religious makeup of the United States exactly where it is now now meaning 1924. So we want the we want the United States to stay a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation for the most part. So as a result, they said immigration has to be 90% white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, to, to summarize and to simplify things. Then in the, in the mid 1960s, that changed and those restrictions on people from Southern Eastern Europe and Asia were lifted. And that's at the point when, however, when uh, the citizenship test became much more uh, severe, I guess might be the way you put it, and you had to learn all these civics things in order to become an American citizen. Next one, Michael. All right, uh, Jim Richmond, who is a, a, a well-known in this area, he asks, uh, nativism is a recurring theme throughout our history. No nothings in the 1850s to Chinese and quotas in the 1920s to Latinos today. The question is, what do you think drives this current in American history? Is it all economics or racism? What do you think? Well, we could have a whole lecture on that question. We could have a whole semester course on that, that question, really. Uh, that was one thing that I've always, you know, I, I retired after 
doing college teaching for 30 years and I never did teach a course on nativism, even though Michael would chide me once in a while and say that I should. Um, so the answer is, is it's complicated and it changes over time. That's the, the most important thing I think to say, but then to get to the specifics. Um, so one thing I think that drives the, the current is ethnocentrism might be the easiest way to describe it. Like every, every group thinks that they're okay, but has a suspicion of others. And so over time, you know, Irish immigrants, for example, saw no irony at all that they were persecuted and hated, and yet they turned right around and persecuted and hated the next group to come after them. And, but I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that they're exceptional. They are not. Every immigrant group has done that. Every immigrant group has complained about how they're treated, but then has gone ahead and treated others the way they ask not to be treated themselves. So now, of course, there are always exceptions. There are people who are uh, particularly open-minded, but, but overall, that's been a theme. Um, the, but to answer the question, I would say no, economics, when you look at the history of nativism in the United States, economics tends not to be the theme. The, team, the theme tends to be um, uh, more the, this concept that the definition of what it means to be an American includes one's own group, but doesn't include the newer groups. So, uh, so to white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the Irish weren't included. The Irish pushed to be included and then said, all right, well, we're part of Anglo-Saxon. We're part of, of uh, that part of Europe. So we count too, uh, but those other people don't count. And so every generation seems to feel that um, other groups don't fit into the definition of being American, but they don't. So, and, and you look at at American nativism throughout American history and economics actually plays a very small role in it um, overall. Should we go to the next one, Michael? All right. Mary asks, what inspires new immigrants to become anarchists and activists in a country they made such an effort to make their new home? Great question. So the answer is primarily that those immigrants were anarchists before they got to the United States and continued to believe, right? So, so keep in mind that, you know, we, the way we think of anarchists today is a person who believes in no law at all, but that wasn't how the anarchists define themselves. Anarchists define themselves as you know, radical socialists. So, so anarchists define themselves as not people who believe in no law, but people who want socialism but are willing to use radical means to bring that about. And to a large extent, uh, those socialists were people who had tried to bring about um, socialist, the socialist agenda in the countries they came from, but failed there and fled to the United States because they feared being persecuted there and then tried to bring about the socialist revolution they dreamed of in the United States. Uh, so, so, right, Johann Most came to the United States because he feared being put in jail in Germany. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that tends to happen. So that's why you tend to get um, people like anarchists and other, uh, and other radicals among immigrants because they were radicalized before they got to the United States, not typically once they get here. Michael, do we have more or I know we've, we've uh, this, taken this an hour. Call. I know people have only so long they can be on a screen without numbing over. Right, so this is last call at the, at the bar and presentation. Oh, here we go. Mary asks, uh, with people from all over the world here already, what group would be the next victim of nativism? <laughs> Look into your crystal ball. Oh, that's a good one. Um, You know, I, I, I think Muslims are going to stay in that, uh, are going to stay targets for a while, especially 
um, you know, well, I, I, I think I won't qualify it. I'm just gonna say Muslims in general, I think for a while are gonna to continue to be a, a target, um, especially as, as long as the United States stays involved in Afghanistan where, uh, you know, so that, that we associate uh, Muslims in a place like Afghanistan with being the quote unquote enemy of the United States. Therefore, Muslims in the United States will by many be perceived as, as enemies and, and un-American and incapable of becoming true Americans. So that would, that would be for the time being, that would be my prediction. But I think, as I said in my talk, and as I say in the end of City of Dreams, I think one day we'll look back and say, oh, how funny that Muslims were thought of that way, just like uh, Catholics were once thought of that way and, and other groups too. There's no reason to believe otherwise. All right, any last thoughts or questions? Um, all right, well, let me just end by saying, uh, of course, thank you to Dr. Ann Binder for his time. And uh, we encourage you to do two things for all of you uh, watching and listening. Uh, first, to uh, go to Northshire Bookstore and pick up one or all of Dr. Ann Binder's books, uh, but obviously City of Dreams is what, what he was referencing this evening. Um, and please consider uh, becoming a member of the Saratoga County History Center. Uh, you, your very small membership dues go to um, all the various programming that we provide and uh, preserving the museum. So we hope you'll decide to become supporters and we hope that you will uh, support Dr. Ambinder's work by uh, purchasing his books. Uh, and with that, I will say goodnight to everyone. And once again, thank you to Dr. Ambinder for his time and his expertise. Thank you guys for organizing this and thanks for all, all of you who came out. This is such a big group. I'm so pleased. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Good night, you. everyone. All right, I think I'm going to shut it all down, and uh, but we have a recording of it now, and uh, I want to uh, thank everyone here for being here as well, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ann Binder. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for organizing this, uh, Ann, and doing the slides so well, and thank you, Michael, for inviting me. No yes. problem. Thanks, yeah. Ann. You did a great job. I'm so thank glad you. we have you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, uh, I guess that's it. I'm, get, I'm getting text.